Welcome, welcome everyone to the Eagleton Institute of Politics on a very happy occasion. We're always pleased in this wonderful room to welcome friends, old and new, who come to the Institute. Uh, and this morning to have three former governors on hand, all longtime friends and acquaintances of Eagleton, makes it a great occasion indeed. And all who have tremendous respect for one another, which makes it even more special in these times. But most important, today is a celebration, a wonderful coincidence of shared ideals. It's a thrill for us to mark the inauguration of a new program here at Eagleton. It's a program that honors Lou Gambesini, a man whose record of thoughtful public service is decades long and universally respected. Someone whose values and vision match perfectly everything that we believe in and try to foster here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics. When one can start the day with something that's simultaneously a great pleasure and a moment of great meaning, that indeed is a treat. This new and exciting program came about because people who love and respect Lou, colleagues, people who worked for him, his family, and friends wanted to celebrate his life with a tribute larger and more lasting than a conventional toast or a plaque on the wall. They were determined to create something that would reflect Lou's dedication to honorable public service. And their ideas coalesced into the Louis J. Gambesini Civic Engagement Series that we launched today with a particular theme. The theme is called Toward Better Citizenship. Having the great idea is one thing. Making it happen is quite something else, as we all know. Uh, today, I'm really delighted to recognize and thank a number of people who took the seed of an idea, planted it, nurtured it, and now are watching it bear its first fruit. Deborah Wathen Finn, and unfortunately, Deborah is in Colorado today on business, so we're really sorry. We miss her, and uh, she, she sends greetings and is very sorry. But she approached us about the idea originally, and she organized and participated in our original meeting with Jill Gambesini Grillo and Sue Gambesini. Deborah, along with Kathy Sweeney Arnone and Linda Spock, spearheaded the fundraising to make that initial idea a reality. Many people, they're listed in the program that you have, contributed to the series, and we want to thank each of you who did so. It was heartening and inspiring to see the tremendous outpouring of appreciation and admiration for Lou from those he mentored, from his colleagues, his friends, and his family. Lou, you should know that this was a labor of love for everyone involved. Lou is the father of six children, I'm very envious, three of whom are Rutgers alums. Sue and Jill were frequent visitors to Eagleton during their Rutgers days. Sue was in the Eagleton Undergraduate Associates Program and Jill secured an internship through her connection with Eagleton. Lou is also the proud grandfather of eight. We especially appreciate the help of his granddaughter, Christina Grillo, who is with us today. Thank you, Christina. Uh, it's, um, it's, a great, it's a great honor and a pleasure. And to add to that, um, we do have a wonderful speaker and a wonderful program for you. Before introducing the speaker, I do want to say a little bit about Lou himself. Uh, his bio, everyone I think in this room probably knows Lou's bio by heart. But in addition to that, we want to make sure, and it's included in your program, enumerating key positions he held during a career that was focused heavily on transportation. For Lou, the critical thread connecting all of those roles is his dedication to public service as an honorable and worthy pursuit. 
in an essay that he prepared for the public radio series. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, I believe, that series. Lou describes how his childhood heroes during the Second World War were not the sports or entertainment stars admired by so many young people, but allied military and civilian leaders of whom he says, I was thrilled to read of their decisions and deeds. I felt gratified that we were blessed with their courage, integrity, and determination. He asserts that his love of public service continued unabated through a 50-year career, and he says emphatically, I never regretted the choice. When we videotaped an interview with Lou for the Governor Brendan Byrne archive as part of our Center on the American Governor, he reiterated the same message telling how he became interested in public service at a young age and never wavered in that commitment. Since the days when Lou attended the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, where he earned his master's degree in public administration, he's been inspired by an inscription there, the Athenian Oath of City-State, which you can also find on the cover of your program. These words have hung on his wall and guided him throughout his career, and it seems appropriate for us to contemplate them this morning. We will ever strive for the ideals and sacred things of the city. Both alone and with many, we will unceasingly seek to quicken the sense of public duty. We will revere and obey the city's laws. We will transmit this city not only no less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. With those words in mind, we turn to our program for the day. It is, as you will see on the program, a special thrill and honor for us, and I know Lou agrees, we've discussed it, that the inaugural speaker for this series is a man respected and admired for his leadership in public service, for his courage in elective office, and who, like some of us here, have spent a good many years in academia now, UCLA and Northeastern University, he divides his time between the two, trying to teach and encourage young people to enter public service, to inspire them and to teach them some of the, some of the lessons they have to learn in connecting the theories and the case studies that he talks about with the practice. He is a, you all know that Michael Dukakis was governor of Massachusetts and ran for president of the United States. He is also someone who is devoted to the issue of transportation, to public transportation, and was appointed by uh, President Clinton to the Amtrak board, the national board, and was vice chair of that board. So he and Lou have a number of connections, both at the realm of the ideal and in the practical application. When I called and asked him if he would be willing to come and be the inaugural speaker for this new series, it didn't take him five seconds. <laughs> he said he'd be delighted. And we're more than thrilled to have him here. And I welcome you very much back to Eagleton. Michael Dukakis. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth, and thank you all. Uh, it's great to be back um, with the former First Lady of the Commonwealth, who got out of bed at a pretty early hour to get down here. Um, I introduce Kitty these days 
as lots of things, but I usually start by saying that she's unquestionably the best looking Medicare recipient in America. <laughs> and, she really and she always says, but I've been on Medicare for 10 years. And I say, all the more remarkable that you're there. <laughs> and we're also very pleased to have our dear friends, uh, Fred and Ellie Rosen with us, who for some reason left Massachusetts for New Jersey and seemed to be happy down here. And I don't understand this, but anyway, <laughs> this is a great opportunity for us to hook up with them. and. Uh, for lots of other people, Jerry Popper, who graced us with his presence as a visiting professor at the Northeastern, where I've been teaching since I left the governor's office, except in the wintertime. Uh, difficult though it is, Kitty and I drag ourselves out of New England in December, and I teach during the winter quarter at UCLA, and then come back in April. I mean, it's a terrible burden. Somebody's got to do it, and we've been doing it. Um, and I was particularly pleased Lou, and am pleased that uh, you have that Athenian oath up there. Um, needless to say, it's not a bad lead into a Greek American uh, <laughs> inaugural speaker. <laughs> not only that, I quoted it in my acceptance speech in Atlanta, and in a previous inaugural address as governor. And uh, although I'm not sure, Lou, we can say, as a matter of historical accuracy, that Athens was uh, that democratic. <laughs> any more, any more, by the way, than uh, the United States Constitution, a great document though it is, was particularly democratic at the time. Maybe it was the most democratic document around, but ladies, you couldn't vote, uh, people of color couldn't vote, and white guys without property couldn't vote. So uh, both the early years of the Republic here and the Athenian democracy had, had some, unfortunately, common characteristics. Uh, no women's suffrage, uh, slavery, and a few other things. Um, but nevertheless, um, that's a great oath, and I'm delighted that it's guided you. And I don't have to tell you that I share the respect and admiration of everybody in this room for Lou. When Brendan and I and Jim were governors, uh, there were two stars, in my judgment, in the state transportation world. And they both happened to be Italo-Americans. One of them was Lou, and the other was my Secretary of Transportation, Fred Salvucci, and they were very close colleagues and remarkable public servants. Um, now, for some reason, both of them hailed from a more northern part of Italy, so I can't say to them what I often say to my Italian-American friends, which is that if they came from Naples south, they have Greek blood coursing through their veins. Where did your people come from? Jim? Where? Which? Bari. Come to Florida, there's, there's lots of Greek blood courses. Because <laughs> um, we settled all of that. And in fact, if you go to Italy today in what is called Apulia, which is the heel of the boot, you'll find yourself in nine towns where they're still speaking Greek, 2,800 years after Spartans first arrived. And Kitty and I have been there. Now, they spell it with Roman characters, so it's a little discombobulating. And the accent and the dialect is a little different, but if you slow them down, you can understand they're Greek. And Kitty and I had a wonderful visit there several years ago. The mayors of the nine towns gave us a party and, uh, with Greek music, you know, which comes out of Apulia. And um, we just had a remarkable time. And uh, in fact, when you, if you go there, each of these nine towns has a special welcoming sign and a logo which says, Kalos iritate, which means welcome in Greek, but with Roman characters. In any event, the um, problem is that the Greeks wouldn't go north of Naples because it was too cold. <laughs> so you and Sal Bucci come from places where, I'm sorry to say, there wasn't a lot of Greek blood flowing around here. But we'd like to think that our influence was, uh, was uh, important. And then to be here with... Uh, Two governors who I have enormous respect for, uh, Brendan and I, who worked together and, and went through what was a very tough time, as many of you recall, in the mid-70s when they were calling us the new Appalachia up here, and uh, we were struggling to try to dig ourselves and dig the Northeast out of what was a terribly difficult period, the whole deindustrialization de process and so on. And for some reason, uh, Brendan uh, used to call me Mike the Spike. I don't know where that came from, but... Uh, <laughs> But he got me into big trouble because in 1976, the Irish government, as part of its participation in the, bicent in the American bicentennial, I don't know how many of you know it, but a large percentage of the Revolutionary Army was Irish, and they obviously hated the Brits. 
Um, in any event, um, the Irish government invited the governors of the original 13 states and their spouses to come to Ireland for a week. Um, now, you know, I was this ethnic curiosity, this Greek American in a heavily Irish Catholic state. And needless to say, I jumped at the chance to go to Ireland. Never been there. And so over we went. Uh, I was a jogger in those days. These days I do a lot of walking. Um, and so I had my stuff with me. And the morning we got there, I went out through Dublin, ran about three miles, had a wonderful time. Every third person I saw, I thought I knew. <laughs> And that night, that night is our first official event. We were hosted for dinner by the American ambassador to Ireland. It was a guy named Walter Curley, I think. Wasn't that his name? Curley, was that his last name? Um, at the American ambassador's residence in Phoenix Park. Now, the dew falls heavy in Dublin early in the evening. And uh, your then governor had this idea and by the way, we were all cold stone, cold stone sober, that we should have a 25-yard dash <laughs> on the back lawn of the Irish ambassador's residence. Ella Grasso was the governor <laughs> of Connecticut, Lou's home state, um, but not a speedster. So she, <laughs> she decided she would be the starter. She'd start us off. And I'd had this wonderful jog through Dublin. I felt terrific. I, I, I was a distance guy. You know, ran the marathon when I was 17, but I was not a speed guy. And uh, it was Kitty who kept saying, you've got to get in there. You've got to get in there. And I said, I've already had my runner. I don't know what Byrne's talking about. Anyway, well, okay, so we get in there. And we were all in business suits and leather sole shoes. <laughs> So Ella started us off, and you know, the governors are very competitive, I don't have to tell you. I took about two steps, folks, and somehow I slipped, almost somersaulted, and came down on my right shoulder and broke my collarbone. <laughs> Thanks to the governor of New Jersey. And it was Meldrum Thompson, of all people, who even then, you know, was to the right of Marie Antoinette, who kind of looked at me and said, you know, you're in shock. You need some, you know, I was at the line trying to get my dinner, but I was in real pain. But as a guy who has always been interested in health policy, uh, <laughs> it did give me an opportunity to be driven with a motorcycle escort to St. Vincent's Hospital in Dublin where uh, Dr. Gallagher, I said to him, Massachusetts, we pronounce that Gallagher, um, treated my broken collarbone under the Irish National Health Service, and it didn't cost a nickel. <laughs> Something to think about as we're debating whether or not working people and their families in the United States at long last ought to have decent and affordable health care. And let me say, there is no constitutional issue involved in that case. I mean, if uh, my former classmate Scalia can write an opinion, as he did a few years ago, that the federal government had the power under the Commerce Clause to regulate somebody's backyard marijuana patch on the grounds that it has an indirect effect on interstate commerce, nobody's going to tell me that the Commerce Clause doesn't apply to 20% of the GNP, which is what health care is all about. I mean, this is absurd. He better do the right thing. Um, in any event, so... For the rest of our week in Ireland, <laughs> I was walking around with my arm in a sling under a sweater. And when we arrived, Brendan, back in Boston, our then 10-year-old, now 43-year-old, and mother of two, and activist in San Francisco, uh, was waiting for us. And as I came out of customs and came out the door at Logan International Airport, there I was with no arm. And it took us about a half an hour to calm Cara Dukakis down and ensure that I had not had my arm amputated. It was just you know, inside. Anyway, he's responsible for all of this. More recently, however, Kitty and I have discovered something very interesting. She and Brendan may be related. I kid you not. We've been doing a lot of, as I suspect a lot of American families are doing these days, we're doing a lot of geneal genealogical stuff. And in fact, we were the honorees, if you will, the subjects of the 
annual dinner of the New England Genealogical Society where they actually assign a uh, trained genealogist uh, as part of this to do gene genealogy. And since Giddy and I both have kind of interesting lives and interesting backgrounds, uh, we agreed to do this months ago. And then we went off to Europe uh, in early April to explore Kitty's mother's uh, roots. I won't go into them in great detail except to say that Kitty's mother, who I loved dearly, was a beautiful woman, and had a life story you can't make up. She was born out of wedlock in New York City in 1913 to a Hungarian Jewish mother and an Irish father. She never knew her biological father and was adopted at birth by a childless couple named Goldberg, who didn't bother to tell her until she was eight that her nanny was her real mother, and then shipped her off to live with a French family from the time she was 19, nine until she was 13, and from there to a very progressive school outside of Frankfurt called the Odenwaldschule um, from the time she was 13 to 16, and from there to a two-year post-secondary training school in uh, Berlin where she trained as a nurse social worker and became a nurse social worker at an institution for what we used to call the retarded at Spandau, of all places. This is in Weimar, Germany, where she met this young violinist from Somerville, Massachusetts, named Harry Ellis Dixon. They fell in love and produced two great daughters, one of whom I'm proud to say I've been married to as of the 20th of June for 49 years. And um, although Kitty's mother knew that her father's name was Byrne, and we shared this with Brendan, when we were over in Ireland on that trip, um, for the first maybe only time, because Jane never told her, Kitty didn't know that her mother was adopted until Kitty was 17, and was told that inadvertently by her relative. Um, she called Kitty aside before the trip and said, you know, I think my father's name was Edward Byrne. See if you can find out anything about him. Maybe he was the son of Irish immigrants. So Kitty went to a genealogical institute in Ireland and talked to this guy. He said, we have 10,000 Edward Burns. <laughs> what can you tell me about him? Well, the answer was nothing. In any event, sadly, uh, Jane died of uh, esophageal cancer in her early 60s, and it was only a few years after that that Kitty met an Irish American genealogist in New York City who, um, and told him about this. He said, maybe I can help you. In three months, he had the whole story. This guy's name was George Washington Byrne, of all things. <laughs> he was the son of uh, immigrants from County Clare, from the town of Tulla. His twin sister was the best friend of Margaret Buxbaum, Kitty's grandmother. And her name was Kitty. I mean, you can't make this up. And um, so we're now exploring whether or not Brendan and Kitty are related. That's, that's our latest challenge. Anyway, great to be here with both of you guys. And, uh, and I, want to know, I want you to know that, that um, I've been teaching now for over 20 years, and uh, I teach using case studies extensively. And two of my best teaching cases are the New Jersey growth policy case, in which Brenda not only provided great leadership, but Lou was a major factor, written by Charlie Kirker, Brenda, who had worked for you and was my teaching assistant at the Kennedy School, and at my request said, I, I need a growth policy case, and he did it. And another one of my great teaching cases, the New Jersey fiscal crisis case, when Jim was first elected. So I kind of relive all of this and get reacquainted with you guys regularly as I teach these cases, and it's great fun. So it's great to be here. I do owe all of you an apology, and, uh, and I mean that. Uh, you know, if I'd beaten Bush one, <laughs> you'd have never heard of Bush two, and we would be in this mess. So it's all my fault. Blame me take that response really personally. But um, like many of you, I am concerned about what's going on in the country these days politically. It's not that we haven't gone through this before. People say, have you ever seen this so bad? I said, yeah, when McCarthy was running around, it was bad. It was really bad. We were scared to death. But when a Mike Castle is defeated in a Republican primary, and there's no more thoughtful, more uh, decent, uh, moderately progressive guy in America than Mike Castle. And when Dick Lugar goes down to uh, somebody who doesn't sound to me like 
a consensus builder. Um, you got to be concerned, folks. You got to be concerned. And while I'm going to talk to you about one of my favorite topics, the importance of this country having a first class national rail passenger system as soon as possible, even rail transportation until recently has been a thoroughly bipartisan issue. And all of a sudden, it's become an ideological issue. And I don't get it. The president principally responsible for the building of the Transcontinental Railroad was Abraham Lincoln, the good Republican. And Republicans were in the forefront of the expansion and building of a national rail system. In fact, people have said that the national rail system we built in the 19th century was the internet of the 19th century, and it was. Instead of a six-month journey in a covered wagon, you could go from one end of the country to the other in five days, and it was transformational. Um, I served on one of the best boards I've ever served on when Bill Clinton appointed me and five other people. Was Amy around? Rosa? I know she's one of the sponsors and supporters of this lecture series. One of the best boards I've ever served on, appointed by Bill Clinton. Three Democrats, three Republicans. And the Republicans were Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin, governor at the time, became Secretary of Health and Human Services, Linwood Holton of Virginia, who happens to be Tim, K Tim Kaine's father-in-law, and was the first civil rights governor in Virginia history as a Republican. And John Robert Smith, who was a Republican mayor of Marine, Mississippi, and as fine a person as I've ever worked with. But we had a basic common understanding. This country badly needed and needs a first-class national rail passenger system. And we worked our heads off to try to move that ball forward. And the current Secretary of Transportation, a very good person, named Ray LaHood, was a Republican congressman from Illinois until President Obama appointed him as Secretary of Transportation. So, you know, look, I'm a partisan. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I have lots of disagreements. I mean, Scalia, God. <laughs> Even as a law student, he was uh, <laughs> way over there. Very concerned about the delicate balance in the federal system of the course we took on federal courts and federal procedure. I, I was thinking about that during Bush versus Gore, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> um, but the importance, and Lou, nobody knows this better than you, of a first class public infrastructure with a strong emphasis on, on all of its components, including urban and metropolitan transit and a national rail passenger system, is an essential part of this country or any country's economic future. And we've just had two experiences in the last less than a year, which kind of brought that into rather sharp relief for us. Um, like Lou, I served in Korea. I was there, unlike Lou, shortly after the armistice was signed. But I was stationed up close to the DMZ for 1955 and 1957. Um, and last summer, we were invited, Kitty and I, by an uh, international student organization to speak at an international student conference in Seoul. And I stood, it was right after the end of the summer two semester at Northeast. And Northeast, as many of you know, is a 12-month school with a co-op program where kids are rotating in and out of work every six months. And I said to Kitty, want to go back and see where your husband spent 16 months of his life? She said, yeah, why not? So off we went to South Korea and had a wonderful time. Now, I left South Korea, folks, in March of 1957. It was a third world country with a per capita annual income of 50 bucks. And we returned in August of 2011 to a country which has the best airport in the world, which has a transit system in Seoul that is as good as anything I've ever ridden on, and we read, we, we wrote on it many, many times. High-speed rail from Seoul to the southeast and the southwest. When I was there, Lou, we took a sleeper once with some leave time to go down to, Pamujan, uh, to, go down to Busan from 
soul. It was overnight. It was a great trip. I mean, you can imagine you know, sitting there looking at the moon out of this sleeper. Um, today, you do that in two hours and ten minutes in Korea, in South Korea, folks. And Munsan, where I was stationed, seven miles from the DMZ, now has a terrific modern commuter rail system, station because it's connected to Seoul with a first-class metropolitan commuter rail system. The bridges look as if they were painted yesterday. You come back to the United States and you're kind of embarrassed. You're kind of embarrassed. And more recently, during this trip exploring Kitty's mother's roots in Hungary and Germany and France, we went to Budapest, had an incredible time, learned all about the Bucks more than we ever knew. Thanks, by the way, to a Greek-American United States ambassador named uh, Eleni Kounalakis, who I've known for years and who's now our ambassador there. Um, then flew to Frankfurt, took a train to the little town of Heppenheim, where that school that Jane Dixon went to from the time she was 13 to 16 is still there, taken over by the Nazis in the 30s and the 40s, returned to its original board and people um, still there, and uh, we had a wonderful time. Uh, spent five or six hours, six members of the faculty waiting for us. A file that thick on Jane Goldberg with letters, correspondence, and all this kind of stuff. And then when it came time to go to Paris to try to explore the neighborhood where Jane lived until she was nine, or thir nine until she was 13, train back to Frankfurt. We got on one of those German ice trains, 180 miles an hour, Downtown to downtown, Frankfurt, Paris, three hours and 50 minutes, right into the heart of the city. No airport, no taking off your shoes, no $70 cab ride from Charles de Gaulle into the city, just downtown to downtown, three hours and 50 minutes. Pat! How are we doing? So what I want to talk to you about, and there are some people in this room that know at least as much as I do, if not more, about this, is a little bit of the history of this, I don't want to go on it too great length. Some of the things that uh, we tried to do when I was on the board with Hugh Morton and many others, and um, where we're headed, if we know. But there's no question that the investment in the national rail system of this country in the 19th century was one of the great, great achievements. And it didn't happen just through private enterprise alone. I think all of us know. It was heavily subsidized by the government. And it was really a marvel. And that continued on into the 20th century. And in fact, it wasn't just the fact that we had trains. We made them. We manufactured them. We were the leaders in rail technology at that time. And then something happened after World War II. And uh, you're all, at least most of us, were old around here familiar with this. And some of it was understandable. I mean, I was a kid during World War II, and we didn't have a single new car for five years made in the United States. I mean, all the automobile companies were making tanks and Jeeps and stuff. And I remember the excitement when uh, the first Hudson arrived in the neighborhood. All of us, any of you remember those days? Sitting around? And then there was a Kaiser and a Fraser and a Studebaker and a Nash, you know. I don't move around anymore. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons I was a great fan of George Romney, because I'm not a great fan of his sons, as you can imagine. Um, I thought we were going to get a junior version of the old man, and we got anything but. But um, George Romney was the only auto executive in Detroit at that time making a small fuel efficient car. And if the truth be known, I courted this beautiful woman in a little yellow Rambler convertible, because I was a fan of George Romney. Um, but cars were cheap, and we hadn't had them in five years, and why not buy yourself an automobile? And we all know what happened. The development effects, sprawl, all this kind of stuff. Um, now, we did build the interstate highway system, which itself was and is one of the great construction and engineering achievements. But unlike our European friends who built national highway systems, but were very careful to stop them, in major metropolitan areas at a ring road around the outskirts of the city and then invested heavily in transit inside that road, as well as national rail systems. 
we decided we were going to bang these things right through to establish cities. And um, the consequences of that decision are still being felt. There were a few of us, San Francisco, Boston, I was deeply involved in this, that at some point said, enough already, we're not doing this anymore. And in fact, Massachusetts Lou was the first state in the country that not only said, that's it, no more highway construction inside 128, but thanks to a sainted man named Thomas P. O'Neill, who at that time was the majority leader, we became the first state in the country to be able to use our interstate highway money as mass for, for mass transit. And I, about that same time, got elected governor, and we had literally $3 billion in federal funds to invest in the team, which turned it, if I could, if I can say, one of the best public transportation systems in the country. But uh, that was very unusual. And of course, there was a fight in San Francisco, as you know, over the Embarcadero Highway, which had been half finished. And uh, Jack Shelley, who was elected mayor, finally said, we're not going further. And there was a big fight with the Caltrans. And uh, it just kind of sat there, hanging for years, until the good, good Lord decided to take care of it, sent an earthquake, remember, during the World Series down. It cracked the Embarcadero. They finally tore it down. And if you've been to San Francisco these days, the Embarcadero is out of there. There's this wonderful trolley system, which is used, uh, and the waterfront has been opened up again. Uh, we didn't do that, as you know. We spent uh, about $16 billion of your money putting our Embarcadero underground. And uh, as I've often said, Lou, if our friend Sal Bucci had been in charge of that job, it would have been done in half the time at half the cost. But in any event, uh, we have it. Unfortunately, the original plan which came out of my administration, which included a double rail line down the center of the big dig to connect at long last North and South Station by rail was kicked out of the thing. In fact, Reagan administration didn't want us to do any of this stuff. So we're still trying to connect North and South Station by rail. Um, but the results of all of this were clear. Um, metropolitan transit systems deteriorated badly. Many of them, of course, were in private hands until after World War II. Um, and the nation's rail passenger system did the same. But it was a Republican administration in the late 60s that came to the very sound conclusion that the country still needed a national rail passenger system. And it was another governor, a Republican from Massachusetts named John Volpe, who was the Secretary of Transportation at the time, who was largely responsible for persuading President Nixon to do that with support from the Congress. And then the idea of taking the Northeast Corridor in particular and transforming it into a modern high-speed rail corridor surfaced, and it was a Republican president named Jerry Ford with a Democratic Congress who was responsible for that. And Massachusetts, New Jersey, and the states up and down the corridor um, went to work in the mid-70s under the Ford administration to begin upgrading and modernizing the uh, rail right-of-way right right for what we hoped and expected would be uh, modern high-speed rail. Um, well, where are we now? Where are we now? Um, not in very good shape, folks. We elected a president in 2008 who, in my judgment, gets it when it comes to the importance of national rail. And he proposed, as part of the stimulus package, as many of you know, um, an initial down payment, if you will, of $8 billion. And I think most of us who uh, care about this would argue that $10 billion a year for the development of a first-class high-speed rail system, and I'll talk about a little bit about what that means in a second, makes sense. Just to put that in perspective, $10 billion is what it cost for one month in Iraq. Think about it. Think about it. One month in Iraq. That's what we're suggesting on an annual basis. And when the $8 billion was put out there and the states were invited to make their applications for grants to begin building the system, over $100 billion, billion dollars in requests were made by the states for that $8 billion. And a lot of us, I guess, rather foolishly said, at last, you know, we've got a president, administration, a Congress, they understand the importance of this. And in any event, we're in the middle of a recession. No better time to invest, put people to work, and build the infrastructure of the future. 
And then we had the congressional elections of 2010. And shame on us, in my opinion, for permitting that to happen. And all of a sudden, rail has become a partisan ideological issue, and I don't get it. I don't understand it, historically or otherwise. Now, right now, we're spending $40 billion federal dollars on highways, $16 billion on air and air transportation, and $1.4 billion on Amtrak. And I'm sorry to say that if the Republican nominee for the presidency of the United States get elected, gets elected, Mitt Romney has already said that he's for eliminating all subsidies for Amtrak, which means that's the end of Amtrak. And that's the end of a national air passenger system. I don't know what he's talking about. I have no idea. No mode of transportation pays its way. That's why we're spending $40 billion dollars federal dollars alone on highways, let alone what the states and local governments are spending, and billions more on air, and appropriately so. I have no objection to this. But the idea that you can eliminate any support for Amtrak is preposterous. There isn't a national rail passenger system in the world that pays its way, or any other mode of transportation for that matter. And, um, and I think it's clear what we need. I mean, a number of you were part of this planning process um, under the Clinton administration. A well-developed plan for a national rail passenger system was, was uh, planned, aired, discussed, debated. Um, it consists of approximately 13 high-speed corridors, some of them truly high-speed, some of them 115, 120 miles an hour, nothing the matter with that, on existing rights of way. Um, and there's nothing wrong with a kind of mixed system in which you have a combination of these kinds of rail systems. Uh, California, as you, know, is de as you know, is now deeply involved in the debate over whether or not they will build new, a uh, really high-speed, 200, 220 mile an hour rail system. Um, passed a bond issue, uh, a lot of pushback. Uh, fortunately, Governor Brown is out there and is taking leadership on this issue and is pushing it, has done some, made some changes in it which uh, I think make it more acceptable. But we're talking about a 60 or 70 billion dollar investment, but what's that in a state like California? And if you spend three months in California, as we do, trying to navigate the 405, which I think is scheduled to have an average speed for its cars between 6 in the morning and 9 at night of approximately 9.5 miles an hour. <laughs> they're, building, they're spending a billion dollars on an HOV lane, which isn't going to decongest anybody, anything or anybody. Kitty and I uh, kind of have a funny game. Anytime we're on the 405, we kind of are looking for how many people are working. We've never counted more than six. This has been going on now for three or four years. I don't understand it, folks. Thousands, thousands of construction workers ready to go to work, do things, contractors, hungry, want to do stuff. I don't, I don't understand the pace of this stuff. But I don't see how you could look at California over the course of the next 40 or 50 years and not conclude that they need the kind of thing that our friends in Europe and in Asia have been enjoying for years. Japan, by the way, you know, we practically destroyed the country. 1963, the first high-speed trains. Then they were only going 130 miles an hour. Now they go 190, probably going 250 uh, in a few years. Um, and... Uh, and so I'm cautiously optimistic about uh, California, depending on whether or not we have a Congress that's prepared to provide some support for that kind of a system. But uh, there are many, many other existing rail cars in the country which uh, could have excellent transportation in a 115, 120 mile an hour range, and you could have a, a blended system which would work very well. I mean, Florida, for example, another strange governor down there. I don't quite understand this guy. You know. I'm not even sure why he's, he's, he's at large, given his, <laughs> his, his, his track record as a private health executive. But in any event, look, I, th I think there are some reasons why you might decide that spending $2 billion on an 80-mile rail connection between Orlando and Tampa wasn't exactly cost-effective. But when we were on the board, uh, and looking at Florida, in fact, we're, we're, we're asked by the Florida Department of Transportation to uh, do a long-term rail plan. We gave, them, we gave them a plan to take the existing rail system in California, which is extensive, and convert it into 120 mile an hour uh, transportation, rail transportation, for a total of a billion dollars, which would give Florida a really first-rate 
rail passenger system as part of a national system. And uh, if any of you have been down to South Florida recently, as we were this past weekend, you know, there's still a widening I-95. Every time we go down there, there's a widening I-95. <laughs> and it never works. I mean, it's still bumper to bumper six months after they complete the work. I mean, is there any doubt that a state like the state of Florida needs a first-class rail system? Um, well, uh, here we are. And uh, I think the real question is, uh, what are we going to do about it? And how do we try to restore uh, the kind of bipartisan consensus, which it seemed to me was certainly around when I was on the Amtrak board, and even afterwards? As a matter of fact, in George W. Bush's last year, Congress passed the best Amtrak bill we had ever had, and Bush signed it. Now, one of the reasons he signed it was because he was going to be overridden by a bipartisan two-thirds. But he signed it. And that wasn't that long ago. So my plea, my hope, is that uh, we can somehow get back on track, if you'll pardon the pun, uh, get serious about moving ahead now with these carefully developed plans that uh, need no further revision as far as I'm concerned. Um, clearly the Northeast, where most of us come from, um, needs this, and we need something even better than Yosella. And there are plans to do that. But the entire country needs this, folks. Don't make the mistake of assuming that there are only a few places. East of the Mississippi, southeast, they want the Northeast Corridor extended down to Atlanta. They want it renamed the Atlantic Corridor. And the same is true uh, in the West, and even the long-distance trains have uh, a lot of support, a lot of ridership, and serve a lot of communities between the Midwest and the Far West that have no other transportation connection, neither train nor bus for that matter. And Amtrak is uh, absolutely essential to their continued existence. So um, in the presence of uh, somebody who I respect and revere and who contributed so much to transportation, I would simply hope and expect uh, that institutes, institutes like this and universities like this and, uh, and, uh, and a lot of good people that this state has produced um, and that are very interested in transportation. I don't know how many students of mine these days want to do transportation. It's very exciting. And the question is, are we going to give them the opportunity to do so? Um, but we are talking about a relatively modest investment. Um, we're talking about making it possible for a lot of people who have been sitting on the sidelines, unemployed, to go back to work. And that includes not just uh, construction workers, but uh, architects and engineers and uh, a lot of folks that are ready to go on this thing. And uh, I don't have to tell you that what happens in November and I'm not here to make a campaign speech. What happens in November is going to be very, very, very important, both on the congressional side and in the White House. Um, in any event, uh, it's great to be here, um, great to be honoring Lou, and um, to say to all of you that uh, his commitment to public service is a commitment that most of us in this room share. And uh, these days, nothing inspires me more and the opportunity to work with the young people that we're producing in this country. Let me tell you, they're terrific. They've got my generation beat by a thousand miles. They want to do public work. They want to do public service. They're very committed to it. And it seems to me that uh, our job and the job of the Eagleton Institute and universities like this one is to inspire them, uh, shape them, give them a sense of the possibilities, help them to develop the skills that one needs, and it takes a while to develop those skills. I've got scars all over my back, and a defeat for re-election once to show for it, but defeat can be helpful from time to time, providing it doesn't happen that often. Um, and to also, and here Lou has always been, uh, for me, an example, Convince them that one can serve in public life 
and set high standards of integrity for himself and the people that work for him at the same time. And that there is no inconsistency between public service and high standards of integrity. And I'm in the presence of some people who are living examples of that. Now, as I say to my students, there are just two things you've got to remember if you want to go into public service. First, plan to live moderately. <laughs> want to make a lot of money, don't go into public service. And secondly, have a good but conventional sex life. If you're into the other stuff, <laughs> if you're into the other stuff, good luck to you, but don't go into public service. And that, unfortunately, seems to be a bipartisan problem. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I've, I've denied it all along. <laughs> uh, and I also want to thank Mike Tukhani. Anytime I had a chance to teach, uh, he bailed me out, either by giving me the material to teach <laughs> or by team teaching with me. And, and we did at Harvard for several years. So thank you, Mike. And Never let an opportunity go by. Well, I made a great president of the United States. <laughs> anyway, uh, this guy. <laughs> you, you, you remember my name? <laughs> I was telling somebody just the other day, the uh, first time I met Bill Cosby, the comedian, yeah. I said to him, I said, you're a comedian, tell me a joke. <laughs> he said, you're a politician, tell me a lie. <laughs> series of accidents in the past. And I'm president of the Public Utilities Commission. So I open a docket and I subpoena the records. I get a call from Austin Tobin, who's the head of the Port Authority, the, the executive director of the Port Authority, he runs it. He says, you don't have any jurisdiction in this matter. I said, okay, don't come. <laughs> a couple of days later, he invites me to lunch at the old North restaurant. Remember the North restaurant? At the uh, airport, anyway. And we, uh, we agreed that I didn't have any authority, but that he was going to cooperate. And that's how I met Lou Gambasini, because he was running PATH. And we solved, we solved our problems when I needed a commissioner of transportation and, and somebody to draft the first uh, transportation department in the, in, in the country. In the country. We did a lot of things. By the way, we were, we were the first in the country. We had the first picket lottery in the country. So <laughs> 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 made a fortune. <laughs> anyway, uh, Lou was a great commissioner. Of, of commissioner. Uh, only, uh, only a couple of times where I asked him to do something that wasn't on his agenda. <laughs> uh, one time, I think it was, oh, Johnson and Johnson said they were going to leave New Jersey uh, unless I built Route 18. I built, built it out, built the bridge <coughs> over there. Right. And I called them, I said, I need a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> is not in our plans. <laughs> I said, look, you can only go so far. <laughs> Remember that? Johnson and Johnson? Route 18? <laughs> Pat Sheehan? Remember? Same as the time. Anyway, one other time when Princeton University needed something out. Uh, out uh, not not in the university itself, but uh, some property they had. Uh, and you didn't want to do that either. The <laughs> <laughs> so one thing he didn't want to do that I wouldn't do is 
He wanted a penny on the gas tax. Yes. He said, with, with, with a penny on the gas tax, we can do a lot of his projects. I was opposed to it in, in uh, principle. I said, you can't, you can't have dedicated taxes and, and run government the right way. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I waited for today. <laughs> Tell them I was wrong. We could have done a lot with the penny. We could have violated the principle. You probably didn't do it either. Dedicated taxes. Anyway, I, I raised them with raised them a dime. Okay. Ooh. Anyway. <laughs> You don't know how comforting it is to have a guy like Luke Gambasini in, in your government. Because first of all, he was confident. He, he knew what to do and how to do it. Second, he was efficient. He got it done. And third, he, he was worry-free. Because he was a pro. He was a pro. He continued to be a pro, he, con he continued to do things in the transportation area, and he continued to develop a reputation so that everybody knew that in my administration we had a good transportation system, a good transportation commissioner, and a good result. What, I, what more could I ask? <laughs> Thank you. One of the, uh, the things that was important to Lou in setting up this program and is important to Eagleton in general is to both learn and celebrate from what happened before and, and as Governor Dukakis said in closing, to help figure out what should happen going forward. And, and uh, for those, uh, the governors here and others of us who were in, gov in government in what now seems to have been a golden era, although we didn't realize it at the time, um, it's uh, important, I think, to think of, to, to, to talk to today's students and, 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 and think about how do you motivate people to recognize that working in public service and specifically working in government is an honorable uh, thing to do and, uh, and an important thing to do. Elizabeth Motto is the director of the Youth Political uh, Participation Program here at the Eagleton Institute of Politics and has been working in this area in a number of different ways for a number of years and I want to ask her to share your thoughts. Sure. Thank you very much. I'm really excited to be a part of this program today and I got an opportunity to speak with Lou ahead of time and we do have a shared interest, a shared concern in better understanding but certainly um, better encouraging young people to be active political participants. Um, and it seems to me, in light of, of Governor Dukakis's discussion, it seems to me if we are going to successfully um, complete these big-scale projects, these large-scale projects, such as a high-speed rail system, you need a citizenry that um, has a facility, is comfortable with the idea of thinking of the public good before the private good. Um, and I think that's where you see one stark contrast between previous generations and the current generation. I spend a lot of time studying what's referred to as the millennial generation, those born from 1976 on. And they're a really interesting generation. Huge in size, they're um, predicted to exceed the size of the baby boom generation. The most ethnically diverse generation in American history. Very well educated. Um, but there is a stark contrast attitudinally between millennials and World War II generation Americans, baby boom generation, um, especially when it comes to the notion of civic duty um, and putting the public good before the private good. Um, when you ask, when you, would, and when you look at survey research um, regarding civic duty and civic responsibility, overwhelmingly, members of the baby boom generation, World War II generation would say their civic duty is to be active participants, to vote, to pay attention to politics, to be actively engaged in the political process. I would say I would agree with Governor Dukakis that uh, millennials or young people today care very much about the future of, American, of, of, of America. However, they don't necessarily see that um, be making a better future is dependent upon political participation or government. Um, often when you ask, and I have in focus groups here at Rutgers, um, what's your notion, what, what duties do you have as a citizen? 
More often than not, they will say to be a good person, to pay my taxes, to go to work, to not break the law. Um, so a fairly passive sense of civic duty, fairly solitary, fairly solitary sense of civic duty. Um, so my question would be, or my concern would be, when, if we are to successfully implement these big changes that we know we need, can we do that or how do we do that when there is that really different conception of, of civic duty? Um, and as, as Lou and I share the interest in, in un better understanding how you do that, um, is there a way to instill that sense of civic duty in future generations? Certainly we have a nice distinguished panel of public servants who might offer a model on how you instill that sen sense of civic duty. Or maybe it's you disguise the public value of, of these large-scale public projects um, so they don't know it's... It, disguise it and tell them it's in their best interest when actually we know it's <laughs> for the good of the public in general. Um, so I'd be happy if we discuss that later, but that's certainly my interest, and I know I share it with Lou, um, better understanding how to instill that sense of civic duty um, and encouraging it. Before I call on Lou, why don't you say a little bit about what your experience is with the students you do involve, both high school and but particularly college? Sure. Um, well, we do some work. I do a program called Are You Ready, which is uh, in a local high school here in New Brunswick High School, and Are You Voting, which is a pro we brand everything, Are You, whenever possible, um, and Are You Voting um, here on, on the college campus. And I think what I find in the students I work with um, is fairly uh, similar to what you see on a national scale in that as Governor Dukakis um, made reference to, uh, millennials are very interesting in that they're not completely disengaged um, from their communities. I think that's an unfair brand that's been put on them, that they don't care, that they're apathetic. I think that's absolutely not the case. I think they care deeply um, about their communities and want to make their, their communities a better place. But, and we can, again, going back to the discussion earlier, there's good reason for them to be frustrated with the political process. Um, and to see it as not the most productive way to solve public problems. So they're more inclined to volunteer, um, to rep, put, you know, push up their sleeves, go into their communities directly and solve these problems directly because they think it's going to be a more effective solution, um, which certainly we're all in favor of that also. But uh, you know, as a motto I think we've had in the past that politics matters um, and the political process matters and we're preaching to the choir here. Um, but how to help students understand the connection between um, volunteering and solving public problems and the benefits of involving the political process in these solutions. So these solutions are long-term and broad in scope. Um, and so I think um, that's certainly the work that I'm doing is trying to help make that connection. Um, and I think sometimes it's easier, 9-11 was an opportunity, an unfortunate opportunity for young people to see the connection between their, their private lives and their public lives. Um, and so that's certainly something we hope to foster here also. Okay, thanks. Um, before I call on Lou, this is, as you know, the inaugural event in this series, so I want to resolve an important issue. So how many of you uh, would pronounce his last name Gambasini? <laughs> 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 how many would say Chini, and, and which do you prefer? <laughs> well, I was forced by six children, three of whom went to the University of Florence to uh, spend their junior to, to, was it? Uh, junior year in broad under the Rutgers program and they came back all fired up of, with pride in our origins and insisted that we change our name to, to the correct pronunciation Gambaccini so I announced this at the Capitol building in Trenton one day when we were, we were uh, starting a conference on I think it was urban development and I said, I told the story, and I get, you don't know how difficult it is to change your name half, <laughs> halfway through your career. Mm -hmm. And I announced that hereafter I would appreciate being called Gambaccini, not Gambacini, in order to be right with the, the ethnic. Uh, I then introduced the governor, Byrne, who repeatedly said, Lou Gambacini this and Lou Gambacini that. <laughs> And I thought, boy, I really reached this audience. <laughs> well, talk some about your, your thoughts about civic engagement. Okay. I, I have given this a lot of thought. In my career, I've had two sort of parallel careers. One is obviously the major one, transportation. But I always had a love of the discipline, academic discipline of public administration and public service. 
And I came to the conclusion some five to ten years ago that the single thing that if we could make significant progress would be the key to unlocking so many of our other problems is an effective citizenry who understood their obligations, who had the responsibility to keep informed, to hold elected officials to high, high, uh, a high bar of integrity, and who would weigh and judge and discuss alternative <coughs> solutions, but be guided by the public trust. I think it's probably one to two generations, perhaps three, before we could reach that goal. I'm impressed by the success of the right-wing think tanks and over the last 30 years and the huge amounts of money and the incredible achievements they've made. They turned the public perception of the word liberal as evil and conservative as good. They turned uh, red state, uh, uh, blue states into red states in Texas and in Kansas, if you've read the book on what's the matter with Kansas. Uh, it can be done, but we don't even treat citizenship as a, ment as a basis of notation. Uh, in my opinion, the schools have considerably lost ground from the kind of teachers that uh, were committed to significant uh, uh, motivation and inspiration about their country, how the democratic process works, and how the obligation is theirs to make the democracy work effectively. And if this were, in my opinion, and it may be a, a dream, uh, to be successful, it would bring order to so many of these other things that are going out of control and completely uh, in a downward spiral. I stagger to think about how much we have come downhill in the last 20, 30 years. And it gets worse. One of the best Republican senators ever was Dick Luger, 36 years in the Senate, and he was uh, a, one of the, a model of bipartisanship and vision and commitment to <coughs> important goals. Uh, and that's, that's happened after all of this continuing whining across the country about why doesn't government work. Well, when you knock off all the, the good leaders that we've had, and we've had them in both parties, uh, we've apparently, the, again, another success by the Republicans was eliminating all of the so-called rhinos, Republicans in name only. Put another way, the, the very Republicans who helped to make the system work by coming to compromise and often of voting with uh, the other party that is in power. Uh, it's, to me, I was prepared to slip into retirement, and I am retired, and I have been a couple of years. My last job was at Rutgers, uh, at the Voorhees Transportation Center. But this has aroused me more and more. Now, I sadly and blind, and I also sadly have moved to the, into the 80s, and <laughs> that uh, is not great for, for energy and, and activity. On the other hand, the opportunity to work with Eagleton on this strikes me as a wonderful opportunity uh, to really weigh in on many of these issues and think about how to promote these. And I'm now in a retirement community in Skillman, and two of my fellow residents are here, and both of them were leaders in trying to develop what they call elders for tomorrow. Concept being, let's get a political movement of elders going that is not that com committed to promoting an interest group or a lobby for elderly, but to weigh in on how to protect our young people in every respect in healthcare and education and to try to deflect the negative trends that are about, including making college virtually an impossibility at the rate of rise of, uh, of uh, the cost of education. Uh, and that kind of thing, to me, is really quite encouraging. And if we could spread that, it would be an interesting force to, to come on the scene, especially as the baby boomers multiply in the roles of the 65 plus age groups. Um, 
I'm not at all pessimistic about the deep future. I am very pessimistic about the next foreseeable uh, generation or two. I think uh, we've got a lot of damage control and damage uh, removal to uh, undertake and get things back in order. And I think uh, Supreme Court, many of our institutions have shown either total negligence or bizarre performance. And the Supreme Court, Citizens uh, United, the Citizens United decision is just abominable. How they can say in their in their uh, brief that they had no evidence of corruption relating to campaign contributions it boggles the mind, and that opens up a flood of money and uh, pow the increased power for the very groups that should be curbed somewhat. The fact that the outrages of the meltdown spelled out in detail over and over and over, the mortgage disaster, foreclosures, uh, all this, these invented documents are uh, concepts that enriched the financial interests, but uh, in effect stripped billions, trillions of dollars out of the economy, most of the impact of which falls on the lower classes. Uh, these things cannot continue without undermining our democracy and I think uh, destabilizing the country. In fact, I think some uh, leaders of uh, our military have concluded that we're much more vulnerable on that front than we are on the military front, that uh, we could be destabilized. In fact, I think there were some uh, remarks by Osama bin Laden, that that was our Achilles heel, and that's where they were going to be picking, picking away at us. Anyway, I didn't mean to make a soapbox uh, comment. Here, <laughs> but this I, is uh, your soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you who have been unfortunate enough to work for me, you, you've, seen, you've seen that tendency before. Give me a mic and I've run away with it. Uh, may I have a further word? Uh, Please. Um, I look forward to working on that that and other matters with uh, our colleagues at Eagleton, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I want to thank uh, the three governors. They're three of my favorite, very favorite governors. Uh, they, are, they all fit that model of uh, leadership, uh, guts, vision. Uh, it's really a pleasure to having worked with all, all three. Uh, I don't know how many of you know that Florio was featured in a book edited by Caroline Kennedy, uh, Profiles in Courage, which of course was the book of her father also uh, uh, authored. But one of the chapters was about Jim Florio, who stood up to the NRA and tried to get legislation passed on curbing the sale of automatic weapons and lost that battle. but. Uh, was doing the impossible, going at the NRA and, and trying to survive. Uh, that was a measure of his guts. With Byrne, uh, I used to argue with him not to be so gutsy. For example, at the point when we were really at the most delicate point of getting our legislation to create NJ Transit, uh, and the subsidy program was going out of control, and we were getting resistance on the bill, he said, I'm going to stop the subsidy program. And I said, Governor, you can't do that. <laughs> and that would, would of course, uh, uh, frozen all public transit services. And in retrospect, he was right, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it, it took that to get it uh, narrowly by the uh, legislature. May I pause now to thank the three governors, particularly. I'm so delighted that they came out for this, and I'm really <laughs> overwhelmed. I think it's very kind of them. and. Uh, I must say publicly that it was a joy to work with them. I want to thank the three people, that I think it was three, who spearheaded this, ex, uh, this activity, besides a couple of my progeny that were mentioned. <laughs> uh, the Linda Spock, I call her Linda Who. She, <laughs> she worked for me for many years and I think is a superb professional. Uh, Kathy Sweeney, uh, who was our public affairs person at uh, DOT, and uh, uh, Debbie Finn, 
Uh, thank you so much for get, launching this effort, uh, and I hope it will continue to grow in importance and, and yield. I'd like to thank all of you who've come. I'm just touched. I mean, th this is a classy group of people. I mean it. Uh, I think you are the leaders of the country. They're in this room are a significant number of intellectual leaders, operations leaders from around the country. Many of them began here, many of them settled here, but uh, this is a lustrous group, and I thank you all very sincerely for being out and coming out for this get-together. Uh, so please uh, help us try to let this project evolve in a solid basis, and we undoubtedly will call, be calling on some of you to participate in uh, on one subject or another, but uh, join, the, join the effort that you've created. Thank you.